And I spent a lot of time in the book of Romans. And after I got through reading the book of Romans, I just prayed. And I thought I wasn't going to 1 Corinthians, but I just felt the Lord impress upon me. Why don't you read the book of Proverbs? And it had been a while for me since I had gone through the book of Proverbs. And, uh, you know, it's like any book in the Bible. The deeper you get into it, you think, wow, this is so good. This is so good. This is great. I mean, this is fabulous. This is wonderful. And so... I have been just spending, you know, quite a bit of time just reading the book of Proverbs, and, uh, you know, I like to read it out loud. I like to get by myself and just read the Word, and I don't try to get in a hurry. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, Sharon a lot of times will prepare a meal for all of us, and, and you know, she'll, we'll all sit down at the table, and you got three young boys, well, two boys, one young man, and then uh, I'm talking about Luke, and then you got myself, and sometimes she'll just say, can we just slow down? In other words, if I spent this time, much time preparing it, can we at least spend as much time eating it as, you know, and so can we all just slow down? And I think sometimes when we do our devotions, that's what the Lord is saying to us. Can everybody just slow down here? Oh, no, I got to burn through my chapters. I got other things to do here. Well, you know, it's not in, what matters is not what word, word is going through the word, but is the word going through us? And I know you've heard me say this so many times before, but it's not what you're eating, it's what you're digesting that really matters, right? So it's not just eating, but are you digesting? Are you really, you know, allowing that word to break down and to really grow in the word? So tonight we're going to be talking out of the book of Proverbs, and uh, I've just entitled tonight's message, My Favorite Proverbs, some of my favorite Proverbs, because if I do all of them, we're going to be here till about two in the morning. So these are just some Proverbs that I think will be of benefit to you. Now, we know the purpose of the Word of God is to renew our mind, right? I mean, the purpose of the Bible is to get you to think like God thinks. Remember when God said in the Old Testament, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, but as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. Now, he was talking to the unregenerate man when he said that, but yet there's still a truth, because Paul said, over in Romans chapter 8, he said, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, he said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So my whole goal in life, my whole purpose in life as a believer is to get my mind renewed to the word of God. And that happens as I just allow the word of God to, you know, change me and as I uh, meditate on God's word and of course you can't meditate on something you've never read or never heard so as I was going through the book of Proverbs here and just you know meditating on it there's just so many things that have just changed me and helped me and you know just refresh my memory so tonight I'm going to talk about some of my favorite Proverbs, okay? And I'm just going to key in on two different areas tonight. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Proverbs regarding the poor. Proverbs regarding the poor. Now, this is practical. How many know you're going to meet somebody that's poor? Not too, I mean, by the tomorrow, you'll meet somebody that's in need. And so there are Proverbs that relate to poor. And then the second thing, we're going to talk about Proverbs that relate to work ethic, Proverbs that relate to work ethic. So we're going to key in on two areas tonight. And a couple of things I want to say here as we talk about the poor right off the bat. You've got to think of these, that this is Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, and we're talking about a very wealthy person. We're talking about an extremely wealthy, affluent, well-to-do, rich person. And one thing you'll notice as you study about this very affluent, wealthy, rich person is that even though he is very wealthy and rich and affluent, he isn't condescending towards poor people. And I don't know, it just kind of bothers me sometimes when I see people kind of go up the economic ladder, that the higher they go up that ladder, they kind of have a real jaded, harsh view towards people that are less fortunate. I really don't think that's the heart of God. I don't think it was the heart of Jesus. I'm not convinced it was the heart of the Apostle Paul, and I, I don't believe it should be art desire as well. You know, in the Old Testament, there's the book of Deuteronomy in the 15th chapter. God speaks to the nation of Israel, and he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 15, in verse number 11, a passage that Jesus 
quoted in the New Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse number 11, it says this, For there will, there will never cease to be the poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, the needy, and to the poor in the land. So God said, You're, there's never going to cease to be poor people in the land. Therefore I command you, I'm commanding you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in the the land. Now, when Jesus is on the earth, he made a statement, the poor you're going to always have with you. Do you remember Jesus saying that, right? So you're always going to have the poor among you. Now, you say, Pastor, is this scripture re-emphasized in the New Testament? I believe it is in Galatians chapter 6, whenever Paul said this, we should do good to all people, but especially to the household of faith. So notice this scripture here. It says, you shall open wide your hand to your brother. So it's Jewish people helping other Jewish people, right? So when we read about these Proverbs of our attitude towards the poor, we should think of it in the context of the body of Christ, believer helping believer. Now, I don't think our charity should be limited to the body of Christ, but our charity should expand beyond the body of Christ. But our charity, hear this, our charity should begin with believers. So whenever Sharon and I think about, you know, we need to help somebody or if we want to give to somebody that, in, that is in need, you know, we'll think about what's a Christian person, somebody that we know is serving the Lord, somebody that's, you know, a giver, a tither, and, and they got seed in the ground. What can we do to be considerate of them? We need to can be considerate of the orphans. We need to be considerate. You know, the Bible refers to them as the fatherless, people that are in need, and be sensitive to that. So, tonight, we're going to read some of these Proverbs of God's attitude regarding the poor, and then we're going to talk about some Proverbs that relate to work ethic. So, Proverbs chapter 14. I'm going to read a number of these, and this is kind of like a Bible study, okay? You're just going to be able to follow me, and we're going to go along with these passages of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 31 it says, whoever opposes a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Now, when a person reads this, they could say that they could read it, and I think wrongly interpret this passage by saying, whoever opposes or oppresses, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. And somebody said, well, see, God made them poor. How many know God didn't make them poor? God made them, and they happened to be in an unfortunate situation, right? Okay, now I'm going to run this by again. Did you know that God did not foreordain for some people to be broke their whole life? And then there was another group. I like that group better, so they're going to be blessed their whole life. God hasn't foreordained some people to have a miserable time on earth and other people to be blessed. But the reality is, like we said in Deuteronomy 15, the poor, you're, gonna, you're never going to cease to have the poor with you. And so we've got to realize that there are brothers and sisters in the body of Christ that are going through a tough time. And the Bible says we need to be generous to the needy, generous to people that are in need. Be considerate. You know what it's easy to do when people are going through a hard time? Become Dave Ramsey. How many know what I'm saying? Now you say, I, I like Dave Ramsey. I'm not trying to be harsh towards him. But you know, you become all of a sudden going, well, I wonder what they're doing about this. Let me tell you, y'all, you can get some medical bills, and I don't care how hard you work, you're going to be paying on those things for a long time. I mean, there are some things that come to a person's uh, way in the way of expenses that's not always associated with poor choices or you know, not being diligent or not being a good employee, but sometimes there are just things that happen that are just overwhelming, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be a blessing. So the Bible says that we need to be generous to the needy. Generous. You know, you can be generous to a person that's got a dead battery by getting out of your car and offering to give them a jump. Oh, Pastor, I don't have that much money. Do you have any jumper cables? Oh, yeah, I got jumper cables. Now, sometimes I think what we do is we think, well, Pastor, now, Pastor, if I was a multimillionaire, I would be helping more poor people. Well, here's what I want to tell you. 
you got to start where you're at and you got to do with what you have and just look for ways to help somebody. Now, Jesus didn't say you had to go out and give them a filet mignon. He just said, give them a cup of cold water. Do something, lest you do nothing. You know, so in the Bible, the Bible warns us about uh, uh, an attitude of kind of a condescending attitude, but we got to realize they have the same God as we have. We have the same maker. They're loved just as much as we are. When the Apostle Paul talked about things that would never separate us from the love of Christ, one of the things that he talked about was shall nakedness or peril. Peril just means trouble, hard times, distress. That's not separating anybody from the love of God. Nakedness means, you know, you're just you're having a hard time. Well, God's saying those things don't separate people from the love of God, and I'm going to throw a little P.S. They shouldn't separate people from our love either. Amen. Once y'all quit shouting, I'm going to go ahead and go to this second scripture. Okay. So, Proverbs chapter 17. Here's another proverb. Remember, we're talking about the wisest man who ever lived. The man that the Lord came to him and gave him wisdom. It says, and it's kind of similar to the 14th chapter. The 17th chapter has some similarities here. It says, whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. Remember, God didn't make him poor, but everybody is made in the image of God. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. You know, you shouldn't mock the poor. Ah, oh, they're driving an old rattle trap. Hey, you don't want to mock them. You might be driving one next. You know, people do that. You say, Pastor, does that really happen? Yeah, unfortunately, it really happens. How many of people can often forget from whence they came? He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. So the Bible just warns against having a mockery or making a mockery of the poor. Now, remember, we're talking about in the context here, Solomon had wisdom, and we're talking about a nation dealing with other Jewish people. It wasn't limited to the Jews, but most of the interaction that they're having is a nation governing a nation. It's Jewish people interacting with, you know, other Jewish people. Let me tell you, the body of Christ in Africa, by and large, is poor. The body of Christ, when you go into other parts of the world, you realize they, they have great economic needs, and we need to do everything we can to be considerate and to be loving. Notice Proverbs chapter 19 and verse number 17. It says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. How many of you think it would be safe to lend God some money? Okay, how many of you have ever you've loaned money to somebody? And uh, I'm not going to ask this question. <laughs> how many believe that if you were to lend to the Lord that he's safe? I mean, you can trust God. So whenever we bless somebody who is in need... And that, remember, when the Apostle Paul talked about helping widows, he didn't just say any widow. There was a kind of a criteria that they had. He spent a whole chapter in, in 1 Timothy just talking about some of the criteria for helping the widows that were there in the local church. So it wasn't as if they were just running around, you know, raining money everywhere. There were certain criteria that they wanted the, the local church there to fit in but yet it's a picture of whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. You know, everything that you've ever done in the course of your life, God has a record of it. There's a book of remembrance and God sees it. Now, the greatest thing we can do for anybody is get them the word of God. You remember over in the Old Testament where the Bible says there's a famine in the land, but it's not a famine as you know famine. It's a famine because people aren't hearing the word of God. And so the greatest act of generosity, I believe, is we need to be able to get people the word of God. Now you say, well, Jesus fed the multitudes. Jesus fed the multitudes. That is correct. In three and a half years of ministry, three and a half years of ministry, we have two accounts of him feeding the multitudes. So I don't want you to view the ministry of Jesus that he was doing that once a week. Now, I think he was very considerate to the poor. He was very considerate of people that had 
physical needs, and certainly Paul was considerate. And you read the New Testament writings, he was very considerate. But you don't necessarily see where Jesus just on a habitual, you know, once a week, they're out constantly doing this. But yet, that's a part of Christianity. That's a part of what we're called to do, to minister to the spirit, the soul, and the body, to meet all the needs, spirit, soul, body. Notice Proverbs chapter 19 and verse number 22. It says, what is desired in a man is steadfast love. And a poor man is better than a liar. Now, that's how we should view lying. Now, most people say, would you rather be poor or be a liar? You know, most people in the U.S. would say, oh, I'll take the lying. But, you know, God says it's better to be poor than be a liar. And I threw that in there because you know, it just helps us to see how, what God thinks about lying and, and deceitfulness. And, you know, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, you know, they, got, they don't think a thing in the world about having a friend that's a liar. Well, they don't want, you know, somebody that has financial needs where well, they may be putting the pressure on me. But we got to view these things that God says it's better to be a poor man than to be a liar. Okay, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 13. It says, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. So whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. So we need to be alert to people that are in need, particularly widows, orphans. Paul said pure religion and undefiled before God. Actually, James chapter 1. James chapter 1 says this. Pure religion and undefiled before God is this is to visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And so we need to realize that that, that term, religion, you don't really see that word used in the New Testament, the writings of Paul or any of the New Testament writers that often, but here you see pure religion is this. If you're going to talk about, quote, religion, this is what it is, is that you visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and keep yourself unspotted from the world. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 9 says this, whoever has a bountiful eye. Now that's a little vague here in the ESV. In the NIV says a generous man. Whoever is a generous man will be blessed. He who shares his bread with the poor. Now you say, Pastor, if I had, didn't say if he, if he shared his steak. It doesn't say, you know, if he, he shared his you know, some exotic, expensive food, if he just shares bread with the poor. We need to realize that. The generous person is going to be blessed. And one thing the generous person is doing is willing to share what you have. Just share a little bit of what you have. You know, I think it would just help all of us if we, if we just really saw it every day of our life. How can I just share something with what I, what I have with somebody else? How can I be a blessing to somebody else? How can I be generous to help another person? There again, you don't have to be wealthy to be generous. In fact, there's a lot of wealthy people that are not generous. And, and so we just look for ways. You have the widow, the most generous person in the New Testament under the ministry of Jesus we have is the widow that gave everything she had. And so she was very, very generous. Proverbs twenty two sixteen: whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. Now, what do you mean give to the rich? In other words, you know, you're just given to try to impress people or win friendships. But it says whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth. You're doing things, you're you know, oppressing the poor. And you got to look at, that's a dangerous thing when people get into that mode. Proverbs 22, 22, it says, do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. Now remember this is written by the wealthiest man that ever lived. This is Solomon. This is a man that God told him, there'll be nobody else like you before you or after you up until the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of wisdom. I mean, he was a standalone kind of a guy, but he warned the people with their attitudes towards people that were disadvantaged, and you need to be considerate of them. Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 8, 
Whoever multiplies his wealth by interest and profit gathers it for him who is generous to the poor. Notice the phrase there, generous to the poor. So the Bible tells us one of the Proverbs, one of the things that we need to consider is generosity to the poor. Being, being kind-hearted to the poor. And remember, I'm going to say it again, as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. It doesn't mean we don't help outside of the church. It doesn't mean we don't help outside of the body of Christ. But please don't skip over the body of Christ. Be mindful of people that are in the body of Christ. They're your brothers and sisters. You say, no, no, they're not my brothers and sisters. I only got one brother and one sister, and they live in different states. I'm going to correct you. You know, if you're born into the family of God, your family in the kingdom is really just, it's really permanent family. They are your eternal family in terms of brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Can I get an amen here? Remember when Jesus, they, they say, hey, your, your mother's out front and your brothers are out front here, Jesus. And Jesus said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? It's whoever hears and does the will of God. And so, you know, we have a relationship in the kingdom of God that we have brothers and sisters. So, you know, we want to be generous to everybody, but we aren't going to skip over the body of Christ. We're going to do good to all people, especially to those of the household of faith. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 27. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. So whoever hides his eyes, you don't recognize a need. It's a blessing to be able to buy a kid a pair of shoes. Correcto? Be able to get somebody clothes. You say, Pastor, how do I know whether the Lord's leading me? You know, if you see some kid come to church and they got, we call them floods. Y'all know what floods are? That meant when school started, they fit, but now that it's the springtime, they don't fit anymore. And you see somebody, in it, you just think, hey, let's do what we can to help them out. So, Pastor, that'll take, that cost a lot of money. I tell you, I promise you this, Acts chapter 20 and verse number 35 says this, we are more blessed when we give than whenever we receive. And you'll be happier. The word blessed there means it's a spiritual joy. You're happier when you give than even when you receive. And I think we should look for ways to, to do good. Now, if I were to throw out to you, what would be your dream job? What would be your dream job? I remember one time they had this program, you know, talking about what's your dream job? This was, good Lord, this is 20 years ago. And I remember I thought, I had never really thought of that. And I thought, well, pastoring would be my dream job. And I thought, well, I'm doing that. But what would be my dream job? I remember thinking, I was driving down the road thinking, my dream job. And I remember thinking this, to be a philanthropist, to where all you did was go around helping people in need. Now you say, Pastor, I, I, I wish I was a philanthropist. Well, you are, but you aren't giving out, maybe you're not giving out a million dollars. You might be giving $10. But I tell you, when people are broke, $10 is nice. I mean, a gift card, Somebody gave me a Sonic gift card for $5. I tell you, I, I take it. Now, I'm using that to say we shouldn't think of what we can't do. Let's think of something we can do. Look of ways that you can help. I said this earlier. You know, giving somebody a jump. Helping somebody that's locked their keys in the car. There are certain things. See, if you're a giver, you find ways to give. When you don't even have resources. Now, I've been a pastor long enough, and I had a lady in this church for years, and her husband, he had a great job, and he was in the oil business, but, you know, somewhere or another, he never saw fit. To, he wasn't a believer. She was, and, and, you know, he wasn't really big on helping the church. <laughs> she let me know that, and she said, you know, I just feel bad that we're not. But, you know, I, one thing I noticed about her was this. She wasn't able to help financially, but if she was the person always vacuuming, and after every single get-together, she was the one running the vacuum cleaner. She was the one helping serve. She was the one always, you know, helping in the back, doing different things. <clears throat> because if you have a heart to give, you find a way to give. 
Now, I usually say this, teasing people. You know, we're going to pass the offering plate, and if you can't put anything in, I used to tease people, just don't take anything out. I thought y'all would like that a little better than that. But, you know, y'all, if you come to church, you may not be able to put anything financially in the church, but how many know you don't have to take anything, you don't have to drain, you can still look for ways. How can I be a blessing? How can I build up? How can I encourage another person in the Lord? Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 7. It says, a righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. And it's a picture of we don't want injustice to hit anybody. We want to be considerate of people that, you know, have needs. What can we do to help this situation? You know, God, I had somebody approach me just this Sunday. Let me give you an example. And they said, they came to me and this person in their profession, and I'm not going to mention their profession because I don't <laughs> want to keep their, you know, confidentiality. But they said, this is what I do for a living. It's very expensive to have it done. But if you ever meet anybody that needs this, I would like to be able to help them. You know, he said, and, and I didn't put, I didn't talk about it. He just said, and when I followed up with him, he said, it's just been on my heart. This is what I do. This is the work of my hand. This is the type of, you know, how I make a living. And he said, but it's just in my heart. If you meet anybody that needs help in this particular area, for them to get it professionally done is going to be very expensive, but I'm willing to donate my time, and I'm willing to help them. You see, look for ways to be a blessing to people. So the Proverbs chapter 31 says this, open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Be considerate about people. If you read, like I say, in the law of Moses, we're not under the law, but some of the law is repeated in the New Testament in terms of a, a guideline for conduct of life, and you'll discover that, you know, God is considerate of people. Now, Paul did say this, if a person doesn't work, don't let them eat. Why? Because, you know, if they're capable of working, and they have no reason, you know, it, it's not that they're, they are working, but they're just not seeing an increase where they work. That's not what we're talking about. But somebody's unwilling to work and put forth effort, we shouldn't just fund poverty is what we say, correct? We shouldn't just finance poverty, but we want to encourage people to shoot for independence. But yet we realize, like I said, there are people that are going to be needy as long as we're in this world and we need to be considerate of them. Now notice, I'm going to wrap up these proverbs about the poor. Okay, so if you came in a little late, you say, where's he going with all this? I've been going through the book of Proverbs, and I've, I just went through a number of these Proverbs, and I was just thinking, it's interesting, how many of these Proverbs have a reoccurring theme, and it relates to the poor? And I thought it'd be interesting to just put them all together and read, read through them, and just see what God's attitude is, and the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. How many know this wasn't carnal wisdom, this was wisdom that descended from above? and to understand his attitude about helping people. And then we see about the virtuous woman, the Proverbs 31 woman. It says this in verse number 20, it says this, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. So whenever you see this virtuous woman, this very godly woman, one of the characteristics of this godly woman is she's constantly reaching out her hands to the needy. She's considered of those that are poor, less fortunate, and she's looking around. Now, this is a very practical message, and I'm going to reiterate it. You say, Pastor, do you just help everybody, indiscriminately everybody? Well, you know, I want to, but I like to be spirit-led in what I do. And, uh, you know, you, you need to ask the Lord, Lord, show me, how can I be a blessing? What can I do to be a blessing? How many know God isn't calling you to buy somebody their drugs? Can I get an amen out here? I want to I wanna help the poor, Pastor. And they're low on drugs right now. and They're kind of low on beer right now. now. They need beer money, Pastor. Well, I don't know that God's calling us to buy anybody beer money. But I think if people, kids need clothing for school, God is calling us to help them with that. Yeah, people that can't get to work because their cars broke down. We want to help them get their car fixed. And I'll tell you what, when you help somebody that's in need, and the Lord leads you, that person will remember that act of kindness for 25 years. 
when somebody is there for you during a difficult time and they extended kindness to you, you will remember that kindness for a long, long, long time. Can I get a really good amen? All right, so those are some proverbs that relate to our attitude towards the poor. And if you have any issues with that, you don't need to let me know about it because, see, Solomon wrote it all. I didn't write it. I just read it, okay? So we're going to talk now about God's attitude or the Proverbs that relate to work ethic. What does the Bible say about work? What does the Bible say about what we do during the daytime? Well, the Bible speaks to that. The Bible addresses that. Now, here's what people have done. Unfortunately, people have done this. Unless they're in full-time ministry, they think, well, this is the, they think this. This is the spiritual part of my life, and then this is the secular part of my life. But see, God doesn't view your work as a secular thing. Whatever we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. So in one sense, we're all in the ministry. How I many know we're all in ministry? Now, we're not all in full-time ministry, but we're all in ministry. I've never been in a church where you had more people on the platform than you had out in the congregation. So, yeah, most people in the body of Christ are not in full-time ministry. Most people in the body of Christ are in the marketplace. And so God wants to bless the work of your hands. I remember hearing a number of years ago a pastor. It was Pastor John Osteen. And he announced, and he was in his, I believe he was 60 years old, and he announced, we're going to build a new building. And, uh, and he talked about how much it's going to cost, and he was preaching. And he said, I, I, and somebody asked, well, where are we going to get the money for this? And he goes, oh, I got good news. You are going to be the ones that provide for it. And the people kind of looked at him, and he goes, yeah, and I have even better news. God's going to send you the money, and the money's going to come through you, and you're going to be a blessing. You're going to be a channel to be a blessing to help us build this church. In other words, God is going to get the money through you to help us build this church. You just got to get ready because he's going to bless you because, you know, he had waited on the Lord, and he was confident that this was the time for them to build. And so, you know, when it comes to the kingdom, God wants to bless us so that we can help further the kingdom of God. Now, here's what I've discovered. A lot of people like to enjoy the kingdom, but not as many people want to help expand the kingdom. Correcto? Have you ever noticed that if you've got a wagon, you're pulling a wagon through the neighborhood, it, people are more interested in sitting on the wagon than they are pulling the wagon. You know, kids, they, if you've got, you got a bunch of kids and you've got a wagon and they're little kids, they want to sit in the wagon. They don't want to pull the wagon. And that's kind of the way it is in the body of Christ. You know, you get more people that kind of want to sit on the wagon, but yet God, God wants people that are going to help pull the wagon and get the work done. Now, I'm going to give you some proverbs that relate to your work ethic, okay? Now, first of all, everybody in here is working. So, oh, Pastor, I, I'm retired. Now, you see Marlon right here. Marlon has been retired since John F. Kennedy died. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> He said, not quite that long. I think he was, what age were you, 55? You were 60. Well, they bought him out. They bought him out. OG and E. And I remember he came to me and said, you know, I, I, I put the pencil to it, Tom, and I just thought, I, it doesn't make sense for me to work. They're, they're, they want to buy me out. And Marlon said, just buy me out. And it's been a blessing. But, you know, in my mind, Marlon has been retired for so many years. But, you know, here's the, here's the fallacy or here's the erroneous thought there. Marlon is a working man. He works, meaning he's got grandkids, great-grandkids. I mean, he's always active. He's in the church. He's, he's always – so it's not like since he's been retired, he hadn't been working is what I'm trying to say. It's work to do whatever you do. So, you know, everybody here is working. I learned as a pastor early on, this is what I learned. You don't ask – Moms, you never say this. You never say to a mother, you always phrase it this way, do you work outside of the home? Because if you ever just say, do you work? I go, oh my Lord. 
In other words, what their thought would be, the easy thing would be for me to go to work. But, you know, it's really a lot of effort around here with these kids doing everything. So I learned early on when you, when you talk to these young mothers, you always, you know, you phrase it. Now, do you work outside of the home? Because, you know, that, you know, you know how that fur starts kind of going up if you ask them, do they work? Because they definitely work. Okay, we're moving on here. So this sermon is for everybody, is what I'm trying to say. Everybody should be working. We, we should be active. We may not, you know, we may be considered, we may be retired or at different seasons or a stay-at-home mom, but we're all involved in life, right? Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 6. These are Proverbs that relate to your work ethic. Go to the ant, old sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So the Bible says you need to look at the ant. And there's a lot you can learn from the ant, but the big thing here is the ant is able to work without supervision. The ant is a self-starter. The ant is a self-initiator. The ant is making provision now for what's coming up down the road. Go to the ant, you sluggard. You know, a sluggard. And consider her ways and be wise without having any chief officer or ruler. Prepares her bread in summer, gathers her food in harvest. So what is another thing we can learn from the ant? Works without supervision, always thinking ahead. Now, I know, you, know, you know, when God starts day and night, God would talk about night in Jewish calendar. You know, it starts at night, and then there's day, and then that would be the first day, Right? So, you know, even to this day, when they celebrate the Sabbath, it starts, you know, at sundown. In other words, God starts it at night and it goes into the morning. You say, Pastor, I, wait a minute, the day starts in the morning at sunrise. Well, in the Jewish calendar, when God looked at Genesis' account of creation, it started at night and then the day, and then that was the first day. I tell you, from a time management standpoint, it'd just be a whole lot wiser if before we went to bed at night, we started planning out the next day thinking, I'm already in tomorrow. Why don't I start putting together? Because technically, according to God's calendar, we're already in tomorrow. Think about tomorrow, today. Plan ahead. Plan ahead. So the Bible says that the ant is one that just works, 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 works. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 4. It says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes what? A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He said, well, Pastor, I wasn't a four-point student. I wasn't the best student. I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Well, I want to tell you something. You know, you might not have been the sharpest knife in the drawer, but you can be the diligent. You can be diligent. You know, you don't have to have high IQ to be diligent. You know what diligent means? It means you turn the television off. (laughs) Diligent means you, you, you quit wasting all your time. We call it screen time. You know what I'm talking about? You're just sitting there looking at that. What you looking at? I don't know. I'm just looking. It means we're diligent. And it says the hand of the diligent makes rich. Well, God certainly couldn't be opposed to you being rich, rich meaning a full supply, because he's giving you the formula for getting there. It seems like if he was opposed to it, he would conceal it and say, don't share this with anybody. But God says the hand of the diligent will make you rich. Be diligent. Let me tell you, y'all, you don't have to have a Ph.D. to be diligent. You don't. You just say, hey, whatever I do, whatever my hand finds to do, I'm going to put my heart into it. I'm going to be diligent in doing that. And I tell you, that's what the ant is. The ant's just diligent. Just hang in there. And uh, we're going to see this theme repeated time and time again, but just diligence, 
just hanging in there. There's just so much to that. So we're talking about Proverbs that relate to your work ethic. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 5. I'm going to back up and say this. How many know diligent just means a lot of times you go to work when you didn't feel like going to work? Somebody said, you feel, how are you feeling today? Well, you know, eventually you don't, you learn to avoid that when you say, you know what? We're strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So the Bible talks about that the, the slack hand is going to come to poverty, but the diligent hand will be made rich. And then it goes on to say this in Proverbs chapter uh, 10 and verse number 5. The next verse says, he who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. You know, there's a time to work and there's a time to play, and you need to know the difference. And, and we can't waste away our time. How I many you know when you get to heaven, heaven is not going to be just downtime? <laughs> now, it's a time of rest. But you see, even before Adam sinned, even before Adam ever fell into transgression, even before any of that happened, he was still a working man. He was in the garden working. And so we shouldn't view work in a bad way. But God has given us the ability to work. It's like one guy said, if you think today's a bad day, just try waking up without one. Amen? Amen? You know, thank God you're able to, to do something. You're able to be a blessing and able to work. And, and uh, you know, I thank God for a lot of the Hispanic immigrants that we see, you know, here in this country as far as just their, boy, their, how they set about their work. You know, I'm not trying to address legal or illegal. I'm just saying people that have a little pep in their step. Unless you're Native American, how many know we were all immigrants, right? And it's just interesting how that you meet people that, you know, say they came in from other countries. Just the energy legally came in from other countries. Think about the energy that they put into their work and effort. So Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 26 says this, Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. The Amplified says, instead of send him, it says employ him. So like vinegar to the teeth, okay? Do you understand vinegar to the teeth is not real pleasant? That's what they're trying to say. Smoke to the eyes. Smoke to the eyes is not real pleasant. So is the sluggard to those who employ him. You know, we can preach the gospel by being a good employee. We can let our light so shine before men that they see our good works and they glorify our Father which is in heaven. So just through good diligent work and good work ethic, how that, that is a testimony to the world that God is working in our lives. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 11 says this, Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. He who works his land. You know, some people, they're always looking at what somebody else has. Why don't you work the land you have? You know, they drive around, oh, look at that house, look at that house, look at that house. Well, you know, I'm thankful that you can look around all these houses. Why don't you go home and do something about your house? Why don't you all quit shouting? Just go ahead and... Whoever works his land, it's work. We'll have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. What does that mean? Just the person is always chasing a dream. Chasing this. You heard about this. You heard about that. You heard about this. You know, just stay diligent. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You know, there's so many mornings I wake up and I pray. I say, Lord, I, you know, I prayed this. I mean, how many times have I prayed this prayer? Lord, I, I just want to do your will. And I hear the Lord so many times say, you are. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard him say that. Lord, I just want to do your will. He says, you're doing it. But, you know, sometimes we think if I'm going to do the will of God, it's going to be real super duper spectacular. Well, you know, sometimes we can be right in the middle of the will of God and it's not that spectacular, but it can always be supernatural. It can be a wonderful thing. So just work the land you have. Bloom where you're planted is what we say, right? Just, just wherever you're at, just be all there. How many have ever had a job you didn't like? And then later in life you go, wow, I learned a lot. Thank God I had that job because that kind of prepared me for this job. Have you ever had a job and oh, my Lord, God has made a mistake. <laughs> I mean, I've done that. I've had a job before I thought, oh, my Lord, the Lord missed it. He doesn't do it very often, but he did it over here, you know. Y'all have heard me tell the story. You know, I was a uh, when I was in college, I worked, in the summertime, I mowed lawns, and that's really where I made my money, but in the wintertime, I worked for a builder and a developer, and uh, I worked for this man, and, and he, he said, Tom, I'll teach you, I'll teach you everything I know, I'll work with you, I'll, I'll teach you, and he built large homes, developed neighborhoods, I mean, he had a successful business, he said, I'll, you know, I'll teach you what I know, had it well respected. And so I worked with him and worked with him. And I tell you, I, there were so many times I'd go to that job, and i think, now, Lord, you've called me to the ministry. Why am, I do, why am I doing this? I'm called to the ministry. Why am I doing this? And so what happened was, one day I was working, and there was a retired Nazarene minister. And he had heard about me. He says, well, I tell you what I do, son. He said, you're working in the building business? I said, yeah, I'm working. He says, I tell you what, I'd, I'd learn everything you could about the building business. And I said, he said, and I'll tell you, here's the reason why. I'm a retired Nazarene minister. He said, I, I pastored all over the state of Oklahoma, and everywhere we went, we built stuff. We built fellowship halls. We built churches. We built did additions. We built on the parsonage. We were always building. So, son, learn everything you can about the building business, because, see, that could help you down the road. Now, I'm going to tell you, I remember where I was. I remember the conversation. I remember looking at that man, and I remember thinking to myself, you're missing God, brother. <laughs> I became a pastor right here. You know, the first thing, one of the first things we did, started remodeling this building. This was a gymnasium. This was basketball goal here, basketball goal there. One of the first things, we're going to move out there. I remember J.T. Jones looking at me, walking out here one day and saying, well, one day this is where we want the auditorium to be. And I can remember thinking, oh, whatever, you know. <laughs> and I can remember, then we started doing all this work, and I remember thinking, okay, Lord, help me, you know. I, so I'm just saying there's a high probability if you've been praying, you've been seeking the Lord, you've been asking the Lord, help me be in your will, there's a high probability God's hearing you. You know that? You think somebody said? So just realize this. Work your land, and you'll have plenty of bread. Work where you're at. You know, the devil's goal is to get you miserable. Because, see, I promise you this. If you're miserable today, you run about a 90% chance that tomorrow you're going to be miserable. And you run about a 90% chance that next week you're going to be miserable. And you're going to run a chance that you're going to be. Now, I'm not saying every job you need to stay there forever. You need to be led of the Lord. And God does bring us and change us, and there's seasons. But let me tell you, y'all, we also need to realize there's times when God's preparing you where you're at for something else. Work the land. Wherever you're at, be all there. Enjoy the journey. And, and, and you know, bloom where you're planted. Proverbs 12 and 24, I love this one. The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. The slothful, the cut up, the goof off. The person that every time the boss turns his head, he's goofing off. Well, they're going to put him on forced labor. But the person that is diligent, that person is going to start climbing. You say, is there an Old Testament example? What about Joseph? He just kept climbing. 
Put him in a bad atmosphere, it didn't matter. Put him in jail, he still climbed. Put him wherever he would be in life. He had a way of, you know, the ye- if you got the yeast in you, you'll come to the top. So just, if you're a goof off, you got to have forced labor. But it's a beautiful thing whenever you're diligent, you're a self-starter, you just do things out of your own heart. If you'll work that way, somebody will spot you. Eventually, somebody's going to spot you. Somebody's going to see you. And, you know, we ought to encourage people in the workplace. You know, I was at a grocery store. It's a little small grocery store. There was a guy checking me out, and I could tell he was, like, new, and he was working, and I could tell he was very uncomfortable. But when I said, oh, you did a good job. Oh, I did? You know, we need to encourage people along the way. I got a lot of scripture, so I got to keep moving. Proverbs 13 and and four says, the soul, of the, di- the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So the soul of a sluggard craves and gets nothing. In other words, they always want something. But they ain't never got any money. While the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Please know this. I don't care what age you are. Don't ever retire from being diligent. Well, I don't. I'm, I'm retired now. I mean, even if you're retired, you can still clean the house. That one went over real well. <laughs> you're retired, you can still stay in shape. You're retired, you can still, you can find ways of being diligent. Whatever you're at, stay diligent. Proverbs 13 and 11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. So that whenever a person has wealth and is gained real hastily, it's going to dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. You know, sometimes you just realize God will increase you little by little. Be thankful. Little by little. Well, you know, if somebody were to come up here and give you $100, you know, if I came up and gave Darren, Darren, I want to give you $100. Well, Darren said, oh, my Lord, went to church and got $100. Well, how many know if God saves you $100, that's just as good as somebody giving you $100? Correcto? You know, Sharon's car one night, it was snowing up here this past winter, and, um, it wouldn't start. It would not start. And so, you know, we have AAA, so I called the guy from AAA, and he came out, and it was snowing, and he, he took so much time to try to help us, and he, was, he said, I think it's your fuel pump. Fuel pump. And so, uh, you know, I thought, it's the fuel pump. So I immediately started calling some local shops around here. How much does a fuel pump cost for this car? And it was, it was a lot because the fuel pump's in the gas tank. And I said, oh, my, okay. He goes, yeah, well, I got this buddy of mine. He works on cars, and he told me about, you know, another. He says, you might just want to try him. So I called him up, and he said, well, let me bring it down and look. I'll look at it. Well, you know, he brought it down and looked at it, and then, and then I went ahead and just bought a fuel pump, which they aren't cheap. And he said, I'll put it in there. But he kept telling me, you know, I'm just not convinced you got a full fuel pump problem. I mean, I've looked at it. I'm just, I don't mind putting you in a new fuel pump, but I'm just not convinced that's the problem. And so finally, you know, we took it to the dealership. The dealership kept it for a week, over a week. They couldn't figure out what it was. But one thing determined, it's not your fuel pump. (laughs) And they said it, it was in the ignition switch. Of all things, it was the ignition switch. It was kind of an intermittent problem. And, and they said, it's not the fuel. Now, you know, the good news was the Lord saved us. I can't remember how much it was. It was at least $1,000. You know, the, how many know I'll take 1000 if the Lord will save us 1000 Y'all, the Lord's blessing us. Sometimes we don't always get these checks floating down from heaven. How many know if he's saving you money, he's blessing you? And you need to look at that and realize that. So wealth gained hastily will dwindle. Whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Just a little bit here, a little bit there, little here, little there. God's saving us 
and he's helping us out. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 23, and it says, In all toil or all labor there is profit, but mere talk only leads to poverty. You know, just talking. Talking, talking, talking. You know, I like to grill. I like to barbecue. And there's a saying among people that barbecue, if you're looking, you're not cooking. Because there's a real temptation when people start barbecuing and they want to lift that, lift the hood up and just look at oh, look at it, look at it. Well, then they know if you put that hood on, if you're smoking, it takes a long time for that temperature to get back up. It can sometimes, depending on the cooker, to get back up to that level. And there's a saying, if you're, if you're looking, you're not cooking. How many know many times if you're talking, you're not working? Oh, hallelujah. Somebody said, well, I have to sell stuff. Well, I understand that. But, you know, a lot of times we're just goofing off. We need to get to work. I'm going to throw it. How many know if you're surfing the Internet many times, you're not working? Okay. We'll move on to the next one. Proverbs 18 and 19. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Who's he talking to? A bunch of Jewish people here? I think they got this. Slack in their work is a brother to him that destroys. I mean, they're diligent people talking about the nation of Israel. Just Google sometimes what the population of the nation of Israel is, percentage of people in the world who are Jewish, and how many Nobel Prizes, how many Pulitzer Prizes, how many inventions, how many witty inventions have been given to those people. You know, there's just a diligence. We need to be diligent in our work. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 4. The sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. So the sluggard doesn't prepare ahead of time. Think ahead. Be ahead of time. Don't always, you know, be surprised. Y'all, we shouldn't be surprised that the sun's going to come up in the morning, right? Right? We need, to, we need to be prepared. We need to do what we can to live in the now and to be prepared. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 13. Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. So he warns about just, you know, just a passive, indifferent, goof off. You know, but just be engaged, to be in life. Certainly get adequate rest. We're not minimizing that. And the scripture tells us we should get adequate rest. But there's also an, a time to sleep. There's time to get up. Amen. Proverbs 21 and 5. Y'all, this is, you think this is hard to listen to. It's harder to preach it. Because <laughs> I can see some heads moving, some gears moving. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 5, it says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. I think it's interesting because the amplified version of Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 5 says this, But anyone who is impatient comes only to poverty. Hasty. Sometimes we got to stay put when we don't want to stay put. Sometimes we got to just hang in there. Do what the Lord wants you to do. Now you say, Pastor, have you ever had to do that? I've had to do that. I remember one time somebody wanted to come visit with me. They'd visited the church three or four times. They wanted to visit with me. I thought, oh, great, I'll talk to you. Come on. And their ministry was to sit and tell me everything they didn't like about the church. It was painful. Now they they they're kind of they hadn't been implanted anywhere, but that was their ministry was going around telling churches what their problems were, you know. And I remember this lady just sat there, and you know, I was trying to be gracious for a little while. She was just telling me and telling me all this. And, and after that, I thought, okay, what do you do now? I said, Well, thank you. Okay, see you. <laughs> won't be free. I won't see you in a long time, but anyway, I'll see you in heaven. Uh, and uh, and I just went back and started praying. I said, God, you know, uh, you know, a fool won't receive instruction. If there's anything she's saying that I need to hear, I mean, I'm open to whatever you're trying to say here. And I'm telling you, I just prayed, and I heard the Lord speak as clear as a bell to me. He says, you just stay faithful. You just stay doing, you're doing exactly what I want you to do. You just remain faithful. I wrote it down. 
I thought we're going to seal this thing forever. You know, sometimes we, we come against discouragement. We come against things aren't blossoming, flourishing like we think. And you know what we need to do? Just stay faithful to what God's called you to do. Now, here's how it works. You know, at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not standing before that lady. Does that make sense? At the judgment seat of Christ, that lady is not going to look at me and say, I'm going to judge you. Hey, she's not judging me. I'm going to stand before Jesus of Nazareth. And I tell you, I'll answer unto him. And he's the one that will all individually give an account of our lives. And so, work unto the Lord. Can I get a good amen? I'm on a roll here. I got to tell you another time. You know, I, I was one time I was thinking about this one preacher. And, you know, he had this one. I heard him talk about his work schedule, and he did this, and then he did this, and then you know, it was a real orderly, disciplined deal. And and man, I, longer I listen to him. You ever listen to some people? They're trying to inspire you, but the longer you listen to him, you start getting shorter and shorter. And I thought, well, Lord, I, I don't know that I'm being led to do any of that, but I'm not above reproach. You know, I mean, above, I'm not above listening to good sound counsel, and I listen to that. And I started changing all these things. And one day I was driving down the road, leaving the house and feeling condemned because I wasn't doing this and that and the other. And I heard the Lord, I stopped at the stop sign in front of our house, and I heard the Lord say this, you work for me. <laughs> I heard him say that. You work for me. I go, okay, <laughs> we're good. I'm going to chunk all that stuff and, and just... Do what the Lord's called me to do. Y'all, let's do what God wants us to do. How many know the Bible says his yoke is easy and his burden is light? You can do what God's called you to do. There's not any other illustrations coming to my mind, so we'll go back to the Scripture, all right? Proverbs chapter 21 and verse number 25. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. Nobody's above working. Nobody's above chipping in. Nobody's above, you know, just involved. You're not going to be able to outsource everything. We all have things we do. Okay, so you need to be in, involved in working. And thank God you have the ability to work. I can take you down to the hospital. There's people that love a job. They love to work. That'd be the highlight of their life. I can work. I, don't, I have the ability to work. But they can't. They, they, you know, they have certain physical limitations. And so, you know, you, you wake up and you're able to breathe and you're able to get out of the bed and you're able to stretch and thank God, Lord, help me live another day. Help me bring glory unto God. You know, you can't appreciate a nice car fully unless you had a junker. Oh, I can too, Pastor. You don't know. I, I've always driven, driven new cars and, and I can appreciate new cars. No, you can't as much as if you've had a junker. Now, I'm going to throw one at you. You can't really fully appreciate good health unless you had a couple of times when you didn't have good health. And then I was thinking, oh, my Lord, this is awesome. I remember one time, you know, we were out with Sharon's father, and he had a, I don't remember what it was, like a pinch nerve or something in his neck. And we were up, you know, at Dry Gulch USA, their Christmas train, and the whole family was there, and, you know, we were all excited about this moment. And Larry, the longer that night went, that nerve started pinching. And, and I mean, he was in such excruciating pain. And I remember just, you know, he wasn't crying, but there were just tears just coming down his face. And, I mean, he was just, that night was a, that was a long night. And I can remember one time he, he sat in church, and he came to me after the service, and he said, Tom, when you were up there tonight, I think Regina was leading worship or something, and he said, I just felt like it came to me, this, it came to me, it has begun. You know, the healing has begun. And we were driving down the road the other day, and Larry and I were driving down the road, and we had to go pick up this big pipe, you know, for these lights. And we were driving down the road, and it was pouring down, raining. And, and I said, Larry, you've been through bypass surgery, and I've been through chemotherapy. We can handle this. <laughs> hey, you know, 
thank God you're able to enjoy your life, enjoy where you're at, run without getting weary, walk without fainting, and do what the Lord wants you to do. Correcto? You need to realize that. Hands refuse to labor. Be thankful you can work. Say, well, I can't do what I used to could do. But I'm telling you, you can do a lot more than other people can do. Thank God for what you can do. All right, I'm just going to keep giving these illustrations as I get them. Only the scriptures inspired. Some of the illustrations are <laughs> Holy Spirit. Some of them are maybe are just fun thoughts, all right? Oh, here's a good one. I'm re- Y'all ready for this one? Proverbs 21, 17. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Loves pleasure. Now, y'all, I think you don't enjoy sports. You don't enjoy life. Enjoy Little League ball, whatever it is that you're in this season. You know, enjoy those things. But when people start getting so engrossed in those things to where their professional life takes a hit, that's not wise. So involved at work, you can't even work because you're following who got traded to whom. You know, people get all caught up in the pleasure of life. Y'all, God didn't put Tom Arnold on the earth so I could just have pleasure. God put me on this earth so I could be fruitful, so that I could be a blessing to somebody else. Yeah, I have pleasure in doing that. But remember, Jesus found pleasure in doing the will of God. They're not mutually exclusive. Whenever the disciples said, you know, do you want something to eat? He said, I got meat to eat that you know not of. There's something uh, pleasurable, there's something enjoyable about doing the will of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the man who does the will of God shall abide forever. Proverbs 21, 25, the desire of the sluggard kills him for his hands refuse to labor. So I think I read that one. I've repeated it again. But there we have it. Proverbs 22, 13, the sluggard says there is a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. What does the, the, the sluggard is always thinking worst case scenario. You know, don't always look for excuses. Always looking for an excuse. Well, you know, if I wash the car, it might rain tomorrow. Well, it might, but just wash it again. They'll give you a 24-hour pass. Okay. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. I'm gonna get through these. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings, he will not stand before obscure men. Find a man skillful in his work. Find a person who has developed the gift that they have. Guess what? That person's gonna keep climbing. That person's gonna keep climbing. And so we just need to develop whatever you have. Be skillful in it. Develop it. Grow in it. Be the best you can be in any particular area. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 20. uh, Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard, hear this, and the glutton will come to poverty. And slumber will clothe them with rags. What's he saying? Just people that are always eat, drink, and be merry. Well, I, you want to eat and you want to drink, but that's not, you, how many know we shouldn't just wake up first thing in the morning, wondering what I'm going to have for dinner tonight? Oh, I'm meddling now. <laughs> you know, Proverbs talks about one man will eat to live, but the other person just lives constantly to eat. Just, you know, stay just enjoy life without just all the way. I got to go to a party, got to go to this, that. They're just always consumed with pleasure. Find joy in the work of your hand. Proverbs 24 and 27. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. What does that mean? Here's the amplified version of that. Put first things first. Prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourself in the field, and afterward build your house and establish a home. Y'all, 
don't get so preoccupied with domestic things that you just totally let the professional side of your life just crater. I know you, you've got to, you know, when you hear this, you see people that get out of balance on the personal side. But, you know, it's a picture here of, you know, you need to kind of get your act together if you're a single person particularly. How many know it helps to get your act together? Adam got a job before he got a wife. And so prepare your work outside. Get ready for yourself in the field. Afterwards, build your house and establish your home. You know, it's a picture of put first things first. And it's a picture of, you know, prioritize. Hey, we need to uh, make sure we're uh, being diligent in the work of our hand. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 30 says this, I pass by the field of the sluggard. I've only got, I think, two more here, three more. Four more and four illustrations. No, I'm just teasing. It's four, I think it is. Proverbs 4 passages. Proverbs 4, 20, 30 says this. I passed by the field of the sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with needles. Its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and I considered it and I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will, uh, poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Notice that you went by the field of the sluggard, and everything was mowed, and everything looked perfect. Is that what it says? I went by the field of the sluggard, and it was overgrown with thorns. Overgrown with thorns. Well, what does that mean? He's, just, he's not taking care of his field. And the ground was covered with needles. I mean, it just wasn't being diligent where he was at. Stone wall was broken down. What kind of stuck out here with me, it says, and I looked and I received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber. What I love about Solomon, Solomon just didn't go to the wise people and learn something. He could just drive down the road, walk down the road, and say, I learned something over here. How many of you look over here and say, now that's how you do life. Then you walk a little further, and that's not <laughs> correct though i mean he'd just kind of go through life and say oh yeah that, that guy it's working for that fellow okay that doesn't work well you can learn both ways you're not trying to judge anybody you're just observing and you realize hey that's not working proverbs chapter i love this one proverbs chapter 27 and 23 stay on top of things know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds if you ever notice this at your house you think well i'm just going to go outside you know i do this sometimes well, I don't know that I got that much to do around here. I don't know that I got that much. To do. Then you just get out and walk around the house. You know, oh yeah, we got something to do around here. Yeah, you know, I don't think I've got I think we got the day off. Then you realize, okay, we don't have the day off. We got tons of stuff to do around. Here. Know well the condition of your flocks. Just stay alert to things. Give attention to your herds. Proverbs chapter 28, I'm going to read this and then we're going to wrap it up, okay? It says, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. A faithful man will abound with blessing, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, work the land, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. A faithful man will abound with blessing. A faithful man. Faithful. You know, if you'll just be faithful, eventually you will be fruitful. But a faithful man will abound with blessings. Whoever works this land, I, I think we, we, uh, we jumped ahead to the next one, but it's, it's the picture here. Work your land. You'll have plenty. But don't follow a bunch of worthless pursuits. Be faithful. Amen.